Well, let me offer a good morning to each of you. My name is Mike Kruger, the president of RTS here in Charlotte, and I get to kick off day number two here of our Reformation 500 conference with a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we know who you can determine to be the real conference faithful. Those are the ones who show back up again the next morning at 9 a.m. on a Saturday. Even in conferences, God has his chosen remnant, <laughs> and you are it. Well, we're so glad you're back with us this morning. We have a great day lined up for you with some tremendous speakers. Uh, I get to introduce our very first one this morning, Dr. James Anderson, who's the Associate Professor of Theology and Philosophy at RTS Charlotte. In fact, as you'll discover, if you haven't really noticed yet in your in your materials that all the, the, the plenary speakers for the conference this weekend are all systematic theology professors at RTS in some capacity. In fact, I'm the only exception to that. They kindly grandfathered in a New Testament professor, but the rest of them are ST professors, and of course, James is no exception to that. I met Dr. Anderson for the first time in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1999. I was there doing my PhD work uh, at the University of Edinburgh, and James was at the church that I was attending there, and we got together for lunch, and I could see right away that God was doing something very special in James Anderson. Not that long after that, James was doing his own PhD at the University of Edinburgh, and soon rose uh, up as a notable voice in the world of philosophical theology and really one of the brightest minds in the world today in apologetics, theology, and philosophy. We are so blessed to have him at RTS. James is an Englishman who uh, grew up in Scotland. Uh, I'm sure he'll have many stories he could tell about that experience. Uh, but the good news for you today is you get to listen to someone with a wonderful English accent, which immediately makes him the best speaker of the weekend. If you haven't read any of Dr. Anderson's books, he's written many. I will mention one, which I believe is in the book table. It's called What's Your Worldview? And it is an, one of the most creative, innovative, and just insightful books I have ever read. And if you want to get a great purchase today, make sure you track down that book. And if it's not out there, you can find it, of course, in the RTS bookstore or in Amazon. So join me this morning as you welcome Dr. James Anderson. Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be here. It is a real uh, uh, privilege and a pleasure to be able to contribute something uh, to this conference, which already I've been greatly blessed by the two uh, presentations that we had last night. Let me begin with an observation. There seem to be a lot of offended people in the world today. I've started to notice this and maybe you have too. There are a lot of offended people who take offense at a lot of things, and they want you to know it. If, they, if, uh, if you don't actually take note of it, then they take offense. Uh, they're offended at the fact that you haven't acknowledged that they're offended, and they take offense at the fact that you do not take offense at the things that they take offense at. So they're doubly offended. It's a real minefield. Well, I'm poking a little bit of fun here, of course, but it does seem that many people in our culture today are very easily offended, and they're offended by things that no one until very recently was offended by. I read an article earlier this year about uh, an atheist campaigner. In fact, he claims to be the ordained minister of the first atheist church of true science. Yes, really. An atheist who is suing the U.S. Treasury Department because he is offended by the motto, in God we trust, on U.S. currency. One lawyer who's serving as an advisor to the legal team defending the Treasury Department commented, God isn't a dirty word. Well, apparently for some people, it is. The fact is that many distinctive Christian ideas and doctrines are considered offensive by modern people, and the list is growing by the day. 
Conversely, Christians are often among the first to complain about people taking offense too readily and too superficially. We poke fun at the offense mongers. I've just done it. Of course, we recognize that the gospel message will always be offensive to those who are outside of Christ, and sometimes we almost delight in the fact that the gospel is offensive to unbelievers. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But here's the thing. I wonder whether we evangelicals have ourselves lost sight of the offensiveness of the gospel, specifically the offensiveness of the divine grace that is offered to sinners such as we are in the gospel. I wonder whether we have become too accustomed to grace. I wonder whether we have become inured to the real offense of God's grace when placed against our natural way of thinking about ourselves and others. So part of the task that I have set myself this morning is to offend you, but in a good way. I want us together to try to recapture a sense of the offense of the gospel in a way that will give us a deeper appreciation of what it means to be saved by grace and by grace alone. I want us together to try to recapture a sense of the offense of the gospel in a way that will magnify God and put us in our proper, proper place. Because this offense of God's gospel grace is, in the end, a glorious offense. It is an offense that glorifies God. Now, I know that sounds a bit strange, paradoxical even, but bear with me. Now, you will see that the topic that I've been given to speak on is the doctrine of sola gratia, grace alone. And the, uh, the subtitle that I submitted is The Glorious Offense of God's Gospel Grace. Well, before I start to unpack that, I need to define what I mean by gospel grace. This isn't just a, a sort of a shibboleth that I, I just threw in to confirm my Reformed evangelical credentials. I mean something very specific by that phrase, gospel grace. When I talk about grace here, I don't mean grace in a very general, vague sense. I am talking about the specific kind of grace that is offered to us in the gospel the specific kind of divine grace that lies at the very heart of the gospel. If you look up the word grace in a dictionary, you'll find it defined as something like unmerited favor, specifically the unmerited favor of God. In fact, I, I went and I looked it up in one of the Oxford dictionaries, and that's exactly what it said. Grace in Christian belief, the free and unmerited favor of God. Unmerited favor means receiving blessings that you don't deserve, that you haven't earned. And that is certainly true of gospel grace, but it does not go far enough. Gospel grace isn't merely unmerited favor, it is demerited favor. It isn't just receiving blessings that you don't deserve, it's receiving blessings when what you really deserve is the exact opposite. You deserve punishment. You deserve the wrath and curse of God because of your sin, as do I. And yet, we receive peace, joy, forgiveness, eternal life, and all the other blessings that Christ purchased for us with His precious blood. Let me give you an illustration to drive this point home. I have a four-year-old son. He likes toy cars. Nothing very shocking about that. Suppose that I buy him a toy car simply because I love him, not because of anything that he's done to deserve it. That would be unmerited favor. But now suppose that I buy him a toy car, it's a free gift, 
He's done nothing to deserve it. And he takes that car and he smashes it to pieces. And in response, I buy him a new toy car, an even bigger and better car. That is demerited favor. Now, please note that I am not recommending this as a general parenting strategy. If I actually did that sort of thing, you might think I was crazy. But that's precisely the point, is it not? I say this reverently. There is something crazy about God's gospel grace. And if we don't see that, then we've lost sight of what it means to be saved by grace. So, with that definition of gospel grace behind us, we can be specific now about what we mean by this doctrine of sola gratia. Sola gratia means that our salvation is gospel grace from start to finish. Our salvation is gospel grace from start to finish. But once you accept that, it has a number of implications, offensive implications. They are certainly offensive to those who are outside of Christ, but I think if we are honest, if we reflect on our own sensibilities, sola gratia still holds the sting of offense for us as well. What I want to do then is to discuss five reasons why God's gospel grace is offensive. Five reasons why God's gospel grace is offensive. Here's reason number one why God's gospel grace is offensive. It, it implies that sin is real. It implies that sin is real. If gospel grace is demerited favor, then there has to be demerit. There has to be sin. If there were no sin, there would be no need for gospel grace. Gospel grace presupposes the reality of sin. And sin is a deeply theological category. It doesn't simply mean immorality. It means a transgression of the laws of a perfect and holy God. So, gospel grace implies that sin is real, and sin implies that there is a divine law, which of course implies in turn that there is a personal, transcendent God from whom this law comes and to whom we owe absolute allegiance. And so, the idea that sin is real is very offensive to the modern man. Indeed, the very idea that there are moral absolutes has become offensive. Even the traditional language of morality has fallen out of favor. Have you noticed that whenever a public figure now does something that's considered wrong, morally wrong, other public figures will rarely say that what they did was morally wrong. Instead, they'll say that it was inappropriate or unacceptable or offensive. Our public discourse has become literally demoralized. Now, please note that I am not contradicting here what my esteemed colleague, Reverend DeYoung, said last night about moral absolutes in society, because if you scratch a moral relativist, you will very quickly find a moral absolutist. Indeed, if you punch a moral relativist, you will very, very quickly find a moral absolutist. I'm joking. Don't go punching people. <laughs> so, it's no surprise then that gospel grace is offensive in such a culture because the very notion, the very concept of sin is offensive. But what about us? We know full well that sin is real, of course, sin is real, but it's easy to affirm the reality of sin in the abstract, sin in general. What if we make it personal? My sin is real sin. Your sin is real sin. Do we still believe that fully with all of its implications? 
Every sin is absolutely offensive to God and contrary to the nature of God. I wonder, do we recognize that our sins, even now, are absolutely offensive to God? What I want us to see is that our salvation does not make our sin any less sinful, any less real. Yes, we are saved by grace. Yes, we are justified by faith. Yes, we are counted righteous in Christ. Yes, we are being increasingly conformed to the likeness of Christ. But none of that reduces what the Puritans called the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Your salvation does not make your sin or my sin any less sinful. The gospel does not downgrade sin. In fact, to downgrade sin is to downgrade the gospel. Here's the sober truth of the matter. If we have peace with God, if we have fellowship with God, it is only because every moment of every day our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. They are still there. They are still real, but praise God, they are covered. They are covered by the atoning blood of Christ. And that is the only thing right now that is keeping you and me from utter destruction and a hellish eternity. And it always will be. Here's reason number two why God's gospel grace is offensive. It implies that apart from Christ, we are totally depraved and spiritually dead. It implies that apart from Christ, we are totally depraved and spiritually dead. Now, total depravity is one of those terms that very often misunderstood. To say that we are totally depraved does not mean that, we are, uh, that there's nothing good in us, that we are as bad as we possibly could be. Every human being is made in the image of God, and insofar as every human being reflects the image of God, there is good in them. And unregenerate people can still do good things. They, uh, they love their kids, uh, they work hard, they give to charity, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, what total depravity means is that every part of us has been corrupted by sin, and everything that we do is corrupted by sin, such that nothing we do can be tr considered truly God, truly good in the eyes of God, and nothing we do is worthy of any reward from Him. As Isaiah puts it, even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before God. I've got a bottle of water here, courtesy of Christ Covenant Church. Suppose I were to take this bottle of water and put some drops of poison in it. Would I now have a bottle of poison? No. But I would have a bottle of poisoned water. How much of that water would you drink? If I offered it to you, you'd say, well, I'm not going to drink all of it, but well, I'll have a little sip. No, you wouldn't touch it because poison would be throughout the water. That is the pervasive nature of sin in our lives. But what that means is that if we are going to be saved, it has to be by grace alone, because there is nothing that we can contribute to our salvation because there's nothing good enough. Everything that we do is stained by sin. So, the connection with sola gratia is this. Sola gratia says, that we are saved by grace alone from start to finish. And the reason why we are saved by grace alone is because we can do nothing to merit eternal life, not even in the slightest. And that is because apart from Christ, apart from gospel grace, we are totally depraved. We are thoroughly corrupted by sin. But that's offensive to us, is it not? It's one thing to admit you're a sinner. It's quite another to admit that you are totally depraved. 
If I were to ask you to give a proof text for the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, I think it's a safe bet that you would go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one may boast. It's a, it's a standard Bible text for these Bible memoriz- memorization card systems that, and so forth. Everyone knows it. But less well-known are the verses that precede it, which form actually part of an argument by Paul, an argument of which these verses are the conclusion. For Paul, salvation by grace alone is a consequence of our desperate condition in bondage to sin, spiritually dead, under God's wrath. Let me read to you the full section here, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind." But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Our natural state, Paul says, is one of spiritual deadness. Spiritually dead people can do nothing at all to save themselves. They have to be saved by grace alone. You know, I suspect that some Christians think of their salvation in these terms. They think, I I was drowning. I was drowning in sin and in the trials of this life, the troubles of this life, and uh, Jesus heard my cries for help, and He came and He rescued me. No, you weren't drowning. You were drowned. You were dead at the bottom of the ocean. There wasn't even a heartbeat, never mind cries for help. But still, God came and saved you. He pulled you out of the water, and He brought you back to life. You did nothing to deserve it. You contributed nothing to it. That is sola gratia. But if you accept sola gratia, then you must accept that a part from Christ, you were totally depraved and spiritually dead. And in fact, even now, if you were apart from Christ, you would be totally depraved and spiritually dead. Does that thought make you feel just a little uncomfortable? Is that not just a little offensive? Here's reason number three. Reason number three why God's gospel grace is offensive. It implies that we have no basis for prideful comparisons with others. It implies that we have no basis for prideful comparisons with others. Note carefully what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that we have no basis for comparisons. Of course we do. Ronaldo is a better footballer than I am. That's obvious. Bono is a better singer than I am. That's a no-brainer. Keith Getty is a better hymn writer than I am. I mean, how many of my hymns do you sing at your churches? No, my point here is that if sola gratia is true, then I have no basis for taking pride in my accomplishments and in my spiritual state when compared with others. You see, what I am today is a combination of two things, total depravity and divine grace. That's what I am. I'm a combination of total depravity 
and divine grace. Now, which of those two things am I going to take pride in? Total depravity? Mm, I don't think so. Divine grace? No, I can't boast about that either. And what is true of me is just as true of you. What you are today is a combination of two things, total depravity and divine grace. Apart from Christ, you and I are no better than anyone else. Because, as we've just considered, apart from Christ, we are all totally depraved and spiritually dead. Apart from Christ, we are spiritual corpses. And a corpse is a corpse. Deadness don't come in degrees. You can't go down to the morgue and pull out the bodies and say, so which of these guys do you think is the least dead? Gospel grace is the great leveler. It puts us all on the same level ground with no place for boasting. You know, Jesus told a parable that makes a number of points, I think, but one of the things that it does is it underscores the offense of God's gospel grace. It's the, it's the parable of the laborers in the vineyard in Matthew 20. Uh, please, if you have a Bible, look it up and read along with me. And while you do that, just remember, as we were reminded last night, what a privilege it is that you're able to do that, that you can just open up your Bible in your native language and read God's Word and understand it. Matthew chapter 20, reading from verse uh, 1, the, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Jesus says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and, he, uh, and to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever, whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing no, you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So, the last will be first, and the first last. Just put yourself in the position of one of the first batch of laborers. You work a whole day, and you get paid the same as the guy who works just one hour. Wouldn't you be grumbling too? How can that be fair? But that's just it. Gospel grace isn't about fairness. The last will be first, and the first will be last. How can that be fair? I'm British, as you can tell. And one thing that is very important to British people, and you really need to know this, is the ethics of queuing, forming an orderly line to receive service. You go to the bank, and there's a queue, and you join the end of the queue, and you wait your turn. You go to the post office, there's a queue, you wait your turn. You're driving on a two-lane road, and it narrows to one lane, and the traffic is backed up, and you join the end of the line. You never, 
never, never pass down the line and try and cut it. You go to McDonald's. There are four service points, and you still form one orderly line, even if that means that you are backed up out of the front door into the street. It's just what you do. In Britain, failing to observe proper queuing protocol is on a level with murder, adultery, and treason. <laughs> In the British version of Dante's Inferno, the ninth circle of hell is populated with people who cut in line and whose punishment is to stand in an infinite queue, always moving forward, but never reaching the front of the line. <laughs> now, I love America, but Americans do not know how to queue. It drives me crazy. You don't form queues, you form blobs. It's every man for himself. Now, why are queues so important to Brits? Because they ensure that people are treated fairly. The first will be first, and the last will be last. Anything else is just offensive. But that is the language of merit. That is the language of getting what you deserve, getting what you are owed. That is not the way of salvation through Jesus. That is not the way of gospel grace. The last will be first, and the first last. Gospel grace is the great leveler. It leaves no place for pride or boasting in what we have or what we are able to do, and that just goes against the grain of our natural inclinations. We want to be treated fairly, but thank God he doesn't treat us that way. Reason number four. Here's reason number four why God's gospel grace is offensive. It implies that utterly wicked people can be saved. It implies that utterly wicked people can be saved. Do you believe that utterly wicked people can be saved? Oh, yes, of course we do. We all accept this in principle, but do we really take it to heart? Do we live as though we believe it? One of my favorite hymns, or one of my favorite lines in all hymnody comes from the second verse of To God Be the Glory. You, you know it well. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. The vilest offender who truly believes. Really? Not the vile offender. Not the viler offender. No, the vilest offender. That's pretty vile. By definition, you can't get more viler than vilest. Just Try this exercise for a moment. Think of the vilest person that you can. Go ahead, I'll wait. I guarantee you that you can actually imagine someone more vile than the person that you are now thinking about. Guarantee it. But God's gospel grace means that the most wicked, evil, depraved person that you could imagine could be forgiven and receive eternal life. I'm not sure how ready we are to accept that. A few months ago, I came across a news report of a horrific case of child abuse. I will spare you the details, of course, except to say that it was perpetrated by a priest and the father of the child was actively complicit in the abuse. As I read the report, I felt sick to my stomach. I felt angry. I was enraged. If ever there was a case for calling down curses from heaven, this was it. But here's the thing. The man who committed those unspeakable acts is still alive. 
As far as I know, he's alive right now. In principle, he could, by the grace of God, repent and be saved. Indeed, he could do that and die the very same day and be with Jesus forever. I have to ask myself, if I died and went to heaven and saw that man there and knew who he was and what he had done, what would I think? What would I feel? I worry that I would be angry. I worry that I would grumble. Surely some mistake has been made. How did this guy get in here? I'm not sure that I am fully reconciled to the implications of God's gospel grace. Now, of course, there are cases in the Bible of wicked people who are saved. Nebuchadnezzar, Zacchaeus, the thief on the cross, Saul of Tarsus. But I do wonder if we have somewhat sanitized these conversions. I sometimes find myself thinking of the thief on the cross as a, as a pathetic but also almost heroic figure. He wasn't. He was a murderous brigand. He was the kind of guy that if you, if you saw him hanging around your neighborhood, you'd call the police, and if you heard that he'd been arrested and locked up for life, you'd think, good. The Apostle Paul, before his conversion, was a vile offender in the sight of God. He wrote to Timothy that he was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. He described himself as the chief of sinners. He hunted down Christians with the express hope of having them executed as heretics. Isn't that what the Islamic State has been doing to Christians? God's gospel grace means that utterly wicked people can be saved. It has happened, and it will continue to happen. They will have their slates wiped clean, and they will enter paradise. Meanwhile, some of the nice, respectable people in our neighborhoods and offices and gyms and coffee shops will be lost forever because they never turn to Christ. Isn't that offensive? Here's reason number five. Reason number five why God's gospel grace is offensive. It implies that sinners can be changed by God. It implies that sinners can be changed by God. Now, you may say, what is offensive about that? Uh, isn't that what everyone wants? Well, we've already seen that sola gratia implies that sin is real, that we are really sinners and that in itself is offensive to the natural man. What is more, it implies that we are so steeped in sin that we can do nothing to save ourselves. We can do nothing to atone for our sins. We can do nothing to change our sinful nature, and yet, and yet, God still holds us morally responsible for our sin. Now, that is really offensive to the natural man. But just when we say, these sinful thoughts and words and actions of mine, they're part of my nature. I was born this way. There's nothing I can do to change, and it's not fair to require me to change. Just when we say that, God says, you must change, and you can change, but only I can do it. Only I can change you, and I will do it. I'm sure you are well aware that one of the arguments for the normalization of same-sex relationships has been the born this way argument. I was born this way. It's part of who I am. It's part of my identity. I can't change, and I won't change, and no one should expect me to change. I was born this way, and everyone else has to accommodate that. The born this way argument probably reached its peak when it became a song by Lady Gaga, and an anthem for the LGBT movement. And make no mistake, it has a powerful emotional force. But the born-this-way argument collides head-on 
with God's gospel grace. Just consider these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. Are they not among the most encouraging and comforting words in all of Scripture? Such were some of you. But you were changed. You were changed by the grace of God. You see, God's gospel grace is not only a grace that embraces sinners, it is a grace that changes sinners. But that's not what sinners want to hear. Because if we say that we can't change and we can't be changed, then we're off the hook and we can continue in the sins that we enjoy so much. But Jesus loves us too much for that. Jesus loves us too much to leave us as we are. He did not shed His blood so that we could remain in the very sins that sent Him to the cross. God's gospel grace is offensive to a world that grasps at every rationalization for sin. Well, let me tie things together here. I've laid out five reasons why God's gospel grace causes offense. But in the title of this talk, I refer to the glorious offense of God's gospel grace, the glorious offense. So, where's the glory? What is glorious about these offenses? Well, here's why all of these offenses are glorifying to God. They're offensive to us because they put us in our proper place. And they are glorifying to God because they put God in His proper place. If you go back over these five reasons, these five points that I've given you, I think if you, if you, if you meditate on them, you will see that all of them magnify God in who He is and what He has done. They magnify God's holiness and His justice. They magnify God's mercy and compassion. They magnify God's sovereignty and power. The glorious offense of God's gospel grace is that it utterly humbles us and it utterly exalts God. Sola gratia means that all glory is due to God alone for our salvation. Indeed, sola gratia means that all glory is due to God alone for every good thing that we enjoy and any good thing that we find in ourselves. Sola gratia means soli deo gloria. The Reformers saw that, and I hope that you see it too, because if you do, you will be driven to your knees in adoration and worship. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank You so much for gospel grace, the demerited favor that You show us, not because of anything in us, but in spite of our fallenness and sinfulness. Father, forgive us for taking that grace for granted, for treating it lightly. I thank You that even the sin of taking Your grace for granted is covered by the blood of Christ. Father, I pray that You would help us to see these things and to, in response, live lives of grace 
that glorify you and point others to our great, great, great Savior. In His name we pray. Amen.